want to first thank the KITP for having this conference and making it so uh, easy and making the whole thing happen. So, yeah. but, um, okay, we're going to start with Christophe, who's agreed to give a big overview. He'll be speaking for 45 minutes, and then after this, we'll have uh, we'll have the 20 plus 10 talks for the rest of the time. Hello, can you hear me? No. It's good. So um, thank you all for being here and uh, I would like to thank the KITP for letting us organize this program and uh, the conference organizer for giving me the privilege of being the first speaker. Um, I thought the challenge of giving a review talk of, uh, on such a wide topic was um, so a very serious one and I guess I, I sort of failed miserably in the sense that um, uh, I will give a very biased perspective on the theoretical aspect of this work and uh, in order to uh, avoid offending anybody I, I will not put any names so when I mean we it's not the royal we it's the we collectively and I'm referring to our uh, our collaborators and our esteemed colleagues who have been source of inspiration so I will try and, and pass through a few ideas which uh, I, I believe are relevant for why we should care about the cosmic web with a very strong theoretical spin. So um, today I guess it's, it's, it's uh, pretty easy to, to define the cosmic web uh, by just uh, looking at uh, existing surveys. Uh, so the cosmic web is these sets of walls and filaments which we see now uh, quite easily in, in modern surveys. It wasn't always the case, and uh, Jan uh, mentioned last week that uh, in the uh, 70s and 77, uh, they carried out the first uh, survey to find out whether there were any structures on scales larger than clusters, because uh, as he pointed out, if it were the case, they would have to have some primordial origin, given that the, the need free path of a galaxy within the universe over the age of the universe is about 10 megaparsecs, so any structure larger than that would have to be in some sense primordial. The point I want to highlight about this data is that uh, w the eye is sensitive to the structures which have the highest power, so when people talk about the cosmic web, often they're talking about the very large scale structure, but in fact, and this will be the the central point of this presentation, the cosmic web exists on many scales and therefore it has an impact on many scales. One should not restrict our view of the cosmic web as just meaning the very large bubbles of 100 megaparsec or so. Okay, so since we live in the modern age, uh, I prepared my talk by asking ChatGPT what the cosmic web was. And so this is what came out. So the cosmic web refers to the large scale structure of the universe. So the question is, is the cosmic web and the large scale structure of the universe different? Composed of galaxies and dark matter, which are interconnected by filaments and dark matter and gas. By filaments of dark matter and gas. So the important word here is, I guess, interconnected. These filaments form a web-like pattern that extends throughout the observable universe, giving rise to the idea of the cosmic web. So I started working on the cosmic web interacting with Dimitri in 96, and that's where the, the term was coined. Uh, and uh, the chat GPT informs us that the cosmic web is uh, playing a, a key role in the evolution and distribution of galaxies, as well as in the formation of the large scale structure like galaxy clusters and superclusters. So as you know, chat GPT is just uh, writing plausible stuff based on uh, essentially linguistic. So I think it did a, a relatively good job, but uh, since we're experts in the field, what can we say beyond the, the plausible? So when we wrote the proposal, this doesn't have a, a laser pointer, or does it? Oh, I guess it's not here. Well, no, it says laser, so it must... Okay, it doesn't matter. Uh, when we wrote the proposal, we, we gave a slightly different uh, definition of what the cosmic web is. Uh, and uh, we, while... Um, Highlighting, uh, highlighting uh, two uh, important words. Um, the fact that the cosmic web is a dynamically relevant intermediate density boundary between cosmology and galaxy formation. 
So the two important ones is the dynamically, so it, it plays a dynamic role in the evolution of uh, the universe as a whole, and it acts as a boundary between uh, cosmology and galaxy formation. So I guess um, uh, my talk, uh, in my talk, I want to revisit this slightly in a more mathematical way to highlight the fact that the cosmic web is a dynamically relevant anisotropic boundary. And I, I'm going to call this spin two, meaning that it defines a frame or a vectors without direction uh, between a given scale and a larger scale. So I'm, I'm repeating what I already said, which is that I believe uh, realizing that the cosmic web occurs on many scale is an important point. And so uh, in that sense, uh, it's interesting to study the cosmic web to go beyond the uh, spherical halo model and consider that peaks are rigged, uh, meaning that uh, they are dressed by the sets of uh, critical uh, points of type saddle, whether walls or filaments which are surrounding them. And this is true at, at, at every scale. So I'll come back to this uh, analogy. Uh, this is rigging in English, right? The sets of, uh, okay. Accastillage en français. So uh, the, since I mentioned Dimitri, well, Dick and, um, and Lev and Dimitri's work back in 96, the, their definition uh, of the cosmic web uh, relied on uh, looking at the alignments of the uh, eigenframes of the tidal tensor. So the, they noticed that tides are actually longer range than the density when they're aligned with something. So if I take two, two local extra and I take into account the local shear tensor, if the, if the shear tensor are aligned, I get a bridge in between, which is much longer scale than the size of the, of the uh, tide itself if the eigenvectors are not aligned. So that allowed uh, th these people to, to demonstrate that in some sense, the large scale structures are indeed encoded in the uh, initial conditions, uh, which was an unexpected result in 96, thanks to the argument I gave earlier. But this argument actually applies on any scale, which is important for this talk. So the point they made is that the alignment of these uh, eigenvectors uh, induces a high degree of constructive interference in the density field, which creates these bridges. Later on, we got to visit a little bit this, this, this concept by saying that the cosmic web is actually the metric set by the eigenframes of saddle points. So instead of considering two points and considering the tidal field between these two points, we restrict the description of the cosmic web as the, the shape of the saddle point in between. So we switch from considering the potential to the density, but that doesn't really change very much because you can think of the potential as being a, a smooth version of the density. So changing from potential to density is just changing smoothing scale. But the point is that now we only have one point to consider. And so we went from a two point uh, process to a spin two one point process. And this is illustrated in one of our recent papers where we look at the correlation functions of saddles to peak, of peak of a certain height. And you see that the correlation length in the direction of the filament, which is set by the vertical axis here, is much larger than the correlation length of the density. So this is a, another way of rephrasing the original paper of uh, 96. So um, one should consider peak dressed by the neighboring critical point in the sense that if you're a peak here, then the, your environment is statistically anisotropic because you have, you have filaments around you. You have typically more than one, but this is because we're looking at two point correlation functions here. This is the same thing measured in, di in dark matter simulation at which is zero. And you see again that you have the success probability of finding peaks aligned with the saddle frame in looking at peak to saddle correlation functions. So the, the key point, and the, this is the rest of my talk is going to just revisit this idea a few times, um, is that the partial alignment uh, uh, will change anisotropy, the mean and variance of things. Things meaning I'm going to consider different things such as the spin of dark halos or their assembly history or the set of critical events around a given halo. And the, this partial alignment and this, uh, this change in uh, this biasing is a specific signature that the surrounding cosmic web is imposing on the properties of a given object. So um, since this is a theoretical uh, 
institute, I'm allowed to write a few equations. So you, you all, I remind you that if you compute the expectation of something subject to some constraint, so for instance, the presence of a saddle point, then the expectation is shifted by the covariance of uh, the, the covariance between the two variables you're considering. So this is a known result uh, intuitively, but keep in mind that the, the covariance are also modified by the, sorry, the, the a posteriori variance is also modified by the covariance. So if you're interested in how likely a given event is, the fact that you've biased the variance is going to be important. So um, this was uh, known in the sense of this effect in terms of uh, Kaiser bias. If I take a realization of a Gaussian random field and I impose a threshold for collapse and I put these perturbations on top of a long wave mode, then the likelihood of me passing the threshold is going to be impacted. So this is, this is a, big, a cartoon version of this equation in some sense. But uh, what's relevant for us is that the same happens in, uh, in, two, in 3D. So you have uh, peaks uh, without a given boost and I add a wall, I, I'm going to uh, boost the probability of passing the threshold in the vicinity of the wall, which is represented by these blue planes. And the same applies to filaments. So uh, if I impose a density constraint, uh, uh, which is spin zero, uh, that I get an isotropic uh, response. That's what's captured by the spherical collapse picture. But I, if I impose a spin two point constraint, like the presence of a filament, I generate an isotropy. And this is what is relevant. So as I said, partial alignment with bias and isotropic the means and variance of things. And I'm going to revisit tidal talk theory, excursion set theory, critical event theory. And I'll say a few words about this settling if I have time. Um, and uh, I will show that uh, the, the presence of these uh, cosmic web uh, typically has some impact on uh, all these properties and not necessarily a huge impact. So in that sense, the spherical collapse picture is a good picture and, uh, and it tells you that essentially the properties of objects is defined by their mass. But there is some small uh, impact on, on the cosmic web on properties of dark halos and galaxies. But the impact is much more dramatic as soon as you put baryons into the picture and you account for the fact that the baryons are going to flow preferentially along the direction set by the cosmic web. So this funneling that ChatGPT was telling us about is actually very important in practice. So well done, ChatGPT. Uh, so it really matters for baryons, alignment funnel gas along the cosmic webs and small scales inherit coherence, coherence and stability from the larger scale. So what's great about this is that the gas, contrary to the baryons, will shock and so it will start to behave non-linearly compared to the, to the dark matter. And because the large scale structure are less dense than uh, the inner regions of uh, dark halos, uh, they evolve more slowly, so you, the, the, the gas allows you to inject coherence from large scales to smaller scales. That's very important for galaxy evolution. Okay, so I, I pre basically given my talk, now I'm just going to illustrate this to you for another half an hour, but um, I hope uh, I gave you a glimpse of where I'm heading. So this is a... a a simulation made by um, uh, Agertz and uh, Florent, who's in the room somewhere, or was it over there, which beautifully shows uh, how the coherence set up by the presence of this large scale filament is actually helping uh, the Milky Way like disk to reform continuously because of the fact that uh, the large scale structures are young, so not very dense, and partially anisotropic, they set up a preferred direction. So the, the key ingredient is that the gas collectively uh, flows along the cosmic web. So it goes from the voids to the walls, from the walls to the filaments, and from the filament to the CGM before putting itself into orbit around the disk. And every time it meets a new feature of the cosmic web, it shocks and lose one component of its momentum. And, uh, and this allows the disk to build up uh, in a stratified manner because uh, uh, well, I'll explain later. Oh yeah, I'll explain now. And so uh, this is why it's important to consider not the isolated dark, spherical dark halo, but to account for its rigging, because basically a, a given dark halo is going to be surrounded by voids of different sizes. And so 
these different this voids of different size are going to push around uh, what I would call the cells of the cosmic web, or the, you can think of them as the wall of the cosmic web, because if you have a big void in this direction and a smaller void there, the wall in between is going to move transversely. And then all this stuff is going to be carried along the filaments into the dark halos. And so the, the transverse motion, which has been inherited by the fact that voids repel, is being propagated and converted into angular momentum stratification for the central object. So you see that the, the, the fact that the halo is rigged is actually very important for gas inflow, for the, for the uh, acquisition of angular momentum along gas inflow. So this is the, the, the picture that we need to slightly revisit. This is the power spectrum of matter as a function of spatial frequency. Forget about the units because I don't remember what they are. This is just a purely qualitative plot. So we have the classical hierarchical picture of a, a structure forming on larger and larger scales. But in parallel, as uh, one, uh, one object has started collapsing, uh, the, the, the uh, surrounding uh, uh, large-scale structure or surrounding anisotropy has also collapsed on a couple of axes. And so uh, thanks to the cold flows that I've, to the cold gas flowing along the filament, you have a top-down uh, 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 nonlinear coupling between what's happening on, on the cosmic web scale and on the uh, ISM or CGM scale, uh, due to the gas being funneled uh, along these uh, uh, cosmic filaments which are connected to a given halo. So this is, um, this is an important and interesting uh, add-on to the classical picture because uh, it allows you to connect multiple scales in a non-trivial manner. And, and uh, the, the net effect is that you inherit stability which comes from the larger scales down to the smaller scales. Okay, so let me now uh, revisit my uh, three uh, uh, pillars of uh, large-scale structure dynamics by uh, dressing everything with a set of saddle points around dark halos. So uh, a small metric change uh, biases um, an isotropy, uh, the mean and variance of things. So the thing I'm going to consider here is the uh, prediction for the uh, angular momentum according to Dital torque theory. Hydro torque theory is a measure of how two uh, tensors are misaligned. You've got the inertial tensor of the galaxy or the dark halo on small scales and its tidal tensor on larger scales. If these two tensors are not aligned, uh, they, they will realign and this will generate a spin whose vector is out of the plane of the projector. So this is tidal torque theory in, uh, in, uh, in a cartoon. And so the question is, what happens if I uh, impose that away from this forming dark halo, there's a saddle point here. So I have a dark halo here and there's a saddle point here, which is a point process representing the presence of a filament. And so there are two uh, vectors in this problem. There's this vector that I just described, which corresponds to the orientation of the... Um, uh, sorry, there's two vectors in this problem. There's the vector corresponding to the frame of the saddle and there's the separation vector between the position of the halo and uh, this, uh, this saddle. And uh, the question is, what does it do to this third vector which is given by the uh, prediction of tidal torque theory in that frame? So let's do this first purely qualitatively. I have my two inertial ten two tensors here. The inner one, the dark red, is the inertial tensor, and the uh, pinkish uh, red is the tidal field. And now I'm going to impose that uh, th they are both in the vicinity of a wall and a filament. The uh, small scale structure, uh, the inertial tensor, is going to be sensitive to what's closest to it, which is the pancake in this instance. Whereas the larger scale tensor is, is sort of probing regions uh, further out, so it's sensitive to both the presence of the wall and the presence of the filament. The net effect is that these two tensors are going to be pointing in this direction versus that direction, so it's going to generate a spin which is parallel to the axis of the filament, right? That's just geometry for you. If I make the same reasoning uh, and focusing this time on the uh, a filament and a peak, so I've moved closer to the, the peak of the large scale structure, which would be like above here, then I can make a similar argument. The inertial tensor points towards the filament, whereas the um, uh, tidal tensor points also towards the peak. It generates a spin which is perpendicular, so which is along E phi, it's, it goes around the filament. 
So if you do the calculation, you compute the conditional uh, um, tidal torque prediction subject to the presence of the saddle point, and you have a flattened saddle here, you will find that uh, the spin, uh, as predicted by tidal torque theory, has this quadrupolar uh, structure. It points uh, upwards uh, parallel along the filament next to the saddle, and it goes around uh, in, away from the saddle. Is that clear for everybody, the 3D aspect of this image? Yes? I had a question. <laughs> well, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure it works with questions. But, but are the nodes at the, what happens at the nodes, are you going to say? I, I, I don't say anything about what happens at the nodes because I'm representing the filament just by a saddle point. Uh, you could, uh, because I'm, I'm interested specifically about what's, what filaments are doing. You could do the same conditional tidal torque theory subject to a, to a, a peak, but the peak would be less anisotropic than the filament, so it would probably have a less of a strong impact on, on uh, the orientation of the, uh, of, the, of the angular momentum. So this is the same picture. Again, we have the saddle point here. We have our flattened filament, and we have the, the spin, which is quad, quadrupolar in the plane of the saddle, and which is uh, uh, rotating along E phi uh, uh, as you move away towards the node. The important point is that if you do the math, of course, everything vanishes if the filament is axis symmetric. It has, uh, it's completely inherited the, uh, the flattening of the filament. You can see that in a way because if you look uh, in a plane parallel to the plane of the filament, you see that the angular momentum is doing this, right? And say so it's doing the opposite on the other side. So what does this mean? If I make a conditional uh, mass derivation uh, of objects in the frame of the saddle, so I do a press, uh, shifted press shector uh, theory in the vicinity of the saddle, I'll come back to this in the next part of my talk, you get that you get more massive objects towards the node, less massive object at the saddle, and even less massive object in the void directions. If I apply uh, the, the theory I just presented to you, this is the prediction for the angle of the uh, spin direction uh, with respect to the filament direction uh, uh, as a function of where you are in the saddle. And if you then, um, so this is a geometric representation of what spin orientation is as a function of position and mass. If you Im remove uh, position from this plot and you just represent mass, uh, sorry, uh, orientation as a function of mass, so you get rid of mass in this, uh, in the, between these two plots, you get this. You get that as you, um, uh, increase the mass of the objects, you know, the, uh, the, the, the spin goes from aligned to the filament to perpendicular to the filament. And this is a, this corresponds to the fact that as you change mass, you're considering either objects which are in the vicinity of the saddle, or, so they're parallel, and uh, as you go to a higher mass, you're going to move towards the peak of the, uh, the nodes of the cosmic web, and so you tend to be along E5. So you see that the transition mass is associated with the size of the quadrant because the, the spin itself is defined uh, in an anti-symmetric way with respect to the, uh, the saddle point. So it has an extension, a zone of influence, which is smaller. It's one fourth or one eighth, depending on how you want to think about it, of the zone of influence of the saddle in terms of density. So the region of interest uh, of this spin flip is actually uh, eight times smaller than you would naively think if you don't keep into mind the fact that we're looking at spin. So we're looking at, uh, sorry, we're looking at angular momentum. So we're looking at the spin one quantity, which has to be anti-symmetric with respect to the saddle. And so this is good because if you naively compute the mass that you expect the transition to happen as a function of redshift, uh, not taking into account this anti-symmetry, you get it wrong by a factor of eight, and so the theory gives a good qualitative match between um, what is measured in simulations um, and uh, what is predicted by the theory in terms of the evolution of the ma transition mass as a function of redshift. This is, of course, directly relevant to it for intrinsic alignments, which are becoming a thing uh, thanks to missions like Euclid uh, or LSST. Okay, so that ends my, um, my first application of how do tides and how, do, uh, how does the cosmic web uh, uh, modify, um, uh, for instance, uh, angular momentum acquisition. And uh, 
as you, uh, I forgot to mention that this effect is relatively small. It's of the order of 5 to 10 percent. So uh, it's one of these things where at the level of the dark matter, the effect is not very large. But it's seen, it's measured, it's important, and it's understood, I hope. Okay, let's, let's do something else now. Revisit excursion set theory. So this is like a press sector uh, on a booster in some sense. So uh, the, the classical excursion set theory is about uh, quantifying the likelihood of having a given density um, and a given slope for the density. So how the density varies as a function of uh, increasing shell size uh, as a way of uh, defining a barrier for structure formation. And so it's a, it, it translates the uh, estimation of the mass function into a barrier crossing problem. And uh, typically, depending on what the excursion is, which is a f the function of how the density varies as a function of smoothing scale, uh, you, you will find that you uh, f up cross or first cross the, the criteria for, for collapse at some different variance corresponding to different mass. I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, with this theory or not, but the details don't really matter for the, the point I'm trying to make here. The, the point I'm going to make here is what happens if I add a saddle point here? How, do, how am I going to bias my excursion? And therefore, how am I going to bias, for instance, the assembly mass, the assembly time of my dark halo, or the accretion rate of my dark halo, or possibly its concentration or its kinetic anisotropy? So the, 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 the idea is to, uh, to now say that uh, I'm going to do uh, this excursion conditional to having a mean filament of a certain uh, density or a mean void. And what we see is that if we consider the sine curve or the light blue curve and the red curve, two objects can uh, end up uh, having the same mass, uh, so the same variance, but they will have different slopes depending on whether they've been uh, drawn conditional to the presence of these large scale structures. And so what this means is that once again, we can look at what happens in the frame of the saddle and ask ourselves, uh, what is the distribution of the mass of the object form as a function of where you are in the cosmic web? So again, in that frame, and uh, to go a, a tiny more in the mathematics of the problem, uh, obviously the frame um, uh, defined by the Hessian of the potential allows us to, def to define a new angle, which is going to be the contraction of the uh, uh, direction vector of where you are compared to this, this, this frame here. And so the, uh, the, because of the, uh, the, the constraint, uh, as I told you, uh, the, the presence of the cosmic web is going to bias uh, expectations and um, the mean and the variance of, uh, of these two fields, the field of the density and its, its, its derivative with respect to size. And so you get a mass, uh, a change in mass, which is proportional to that angle and uh, proportional to some function of the radius, which depends on the cross correlation between uh, the two things we've introduced, which is the density field and its gradient, right? So it's, it has this uh, natural expectation. And if we do the same thing for the accretion rate, uh, which is uh, you can derive from the slope of the, uh, so we're looking at expectation of this quantity now, so without marginalizing uh, with, while marginalizing over the other, we get a, a similar um, map, uh, slight, but it's slightly different because the pre-factor, which is a function of distance alone, is different. So the point being, these two maps are different. So what this means is if I place myself into the frame of the saddle, I can look at what the density contours are, which is in gray. I can look at contours of constant mass, which are the dotted curve. And I can look at contours of accretion mass, which are the dashed line. And you see that the free contours are different. And this is a direct consequence of the anisotropy created by the uh, uh, saddle point, the cosmic web, because this saddle point is going to bias differentially uh, the density and its gradient. It's, uh, scale gradient. So I, I won't go into the details, but you can also make such maps for formation time, concentration, uh, we haven't done so, uh, anisotropy, and it's been pointed out by others. So the situation in 3D is you got these three different contours and they differ. So the cosmic web does impact the assembly history of dark halos. Okay? Uh, 
So let me say a few words about something we've been working on more recently, which is uh, critical event theory. So uh, the critical events are going to be defined as special moments uh, in the history of the halo assembly where, where critical points uh, merge together. So they correspond to, for instance, the disappearance of filaments, which for instance, has been shown by uh, Julien and collaborators, uh, uh, has an impact on the way a, a given proto-galaxy is being fed because between this redshift and that redshift, one of the filaments is being, the yellow filament is being disconnected. So if you merge filaments together, you have a strong impact on the way a galaxy is going to be fed. So that's the motivation. Um, you can define three types of critical events, one corresponding to the uh, two filaments um, uh, merging together. Uh, sorry, two, one, sorry, one peak and one saddle merging together, so that corresponds to two uh, peaks merging together. This, uh, this maximum is going to be swallowed by this maximum and this saddle point disappears. Uh, similarly, um, you can have a, a wall which disappears between two filaments, so this corresponds to the merger of two filaments into one and it corresponds to the coalescence of one filament saddle point uh, to one wall saddle point uh, merging together. And you can have wall mergers which correspond to a wall, uh, uh, correspond to the disappearance of a void between two walls when you have a, a wall critical point merging with a void critical point. Physically, they correspond to, of course, halo mergers, filament mergers, and wall mergers uh, in, 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 in uh, real space. And the basis for uh, uh, critical event theory uh, uh, is to uh, rely on um, um, smoothing as a proxy for time based on the co spherical collapse picture. So uh, for instance, if I, if I consider here a density field in 2D and I uh, look at its ISO controls, I can identify at a given smoothing uh, the position of the maxima, the saddle points and the minima. And you see that as a function of smoothing, for instance, this maxima is going to merge with this minima, so I call this a critical event. We call this a critical event. Uh, I, I don't want to say a lot about this because um, it's, uh, I don't have for a, for a matter of time, but we can do the fear of this stuff. We can count, for instance, how many critical events uh, occur uh, at a given pos uh, per unit volume at a given scale. So a critical event by definition is defined to be uh, the number of points where there's a, a, crit a zero gradient and um, one eigenvalue which is non-zero corresponding to um, uh, the scale at which two critical points. And what you do is you change from uh, the spatial and scale uh, coordinates to a gradient and determinant of the Hessian coordinate. You introduce the corresponding Jacobian and you can make predictions about uh, the, these kind of number counts. So this is an example. Uh, the red curve was already uh, recovered uh, by uh, um, Anami in 2001 and uh, the novelty of our work is this uh, void merger as well. So you, you can count the number of critical events as a function of mass and time. Uh, as, uh, here as a function of, for different uh, expansion factor and for different mass in units of the mass of nonlinearity. But the point I want to make just now is the following. Um, um, the number of critical events within a given past light cone of a given maxima defines the typical number of mergers, uh, which is of interest because uh, now we're not looking at the mean number of mergers in the universe, but the mean number of mergers that a given halo is undergoing. And the orientation, and this is where the, the, the cosmic wave comes into the picture, of the saddle frame of surrounding events as they merge uh, will define a proxy for the angular momentum of mergers. So you see that this, this uh, theory allows us to capture uh, how is angular momentum advected uh, around a given halo, what, how coherent is this uh, angular momentum advection at the, uh, at the uh, satellite level and not at the uh, diffuse matter level which I discussed previously. Okay, so I want to end with the last part of my talk and uh, move to smaller scales and uh, explain to you uh, in a more hand-wavy way, maybe, uh, 
uh, why all this stuff matters uh, for uh, what galaxies are doing on, on the long term. And so we're going to change scales. We're going to move uh, to uh, the formation and the resilience of uh, galactic disks. And I'm going to argue that uh, the, the coherence that is inherited from the uh, inflow coming from the cosmic web is actually playing a key role in sustaining uh, the, the presence of thin disks in the uh, observed universe. So uh, the, the, the key plot here is that we observe uh, uh, many thin disks on the sky. And so one, one question uh, is how uh, such a uh, fragile structure uh, can survive in a stochastic universe. And you need to form stars in a plane and then maintain them in the disk. And so I've already said a few words about how you uh, form the disk and you saw it is happening in the simulation. But this is uh, trying to get a theoretical understanding of how you maintain the disk fin. So first of all, numerical simulation sh show it's possible. So this is one amongst many. Uh, it's the horizon simulation. And even though on large scales, you've got this stochastic uh, universe, uh, it, it still has very thin disk embedded. And there are a couple of examples amongst many. And uh, Su Kyung is going to talk about this more later in the week. Uh, if I look back at the uh, uh, simulation with a Swedish name meaning the Milky Way, <laughs> Winter Garden, uh, you see that uh, the, the gas has, the, the cosmic web has deposited the gas in a very um, structured uh, manner uh, around the forming disk. And so the cosmic web sets up the reservoir of free energy in the CGM, which is the fuel for thin disk emergence. So that's a numerical observational fact in some sense, debated apparently, if I believe Tom, but uh, that's what I rely on at this stage. And so the synopsis of disk emergence, as I'm going to argue in the next few minutes, um, is that uh, the reason the disk settles is because the, the, its tumory parameter converges towards one. The reason the tumory parameter converges towards one is because uh, the inflow of cold gas sets a tighter and tighter control loop with shorter and shorter dynamical time, uh, thanks to weights which are generated in the week because it's close to being unstable. And how does this impact disk settling? because the wake also stiffens the coupling be between the different rings here. And so the, the colder the disk, the stronger the wake, the larger the coupling. So revisiting the uh, previous uh, slide, uh, the shape of the initial power spectrum uh, is such that galaxies inherit stability from the large scale structures. Uh, which in turn sets up the CGM and uh, reservoir, which is a, an engine for uh, generating order out of uh, stochasticity, which is necessary to self-regulate the thin disk. So the synopsis of uh, the, the process is that we have the cosmic web on the one hand, which throws stuff into the CGM. We have a lot of complex processes up happening in the interstellar medium, but the, the uh, um, and um, uh, it's called gas injection, but the key point is that because of wakes, everything which is happening in the interstellar major is, is being accelerated by uh, proximity to marginal stability, which has a, a sort of self-regulating effect and which leads to tighter coupling. So convergence towards stability is the correspond to the acceleration of the dynamical control loop by wakes and the tightening of the stellar disk is boosting, uh, is boosted by torques and increased dissipation. So it's because we're looking at a system which is open, dissipative and self-regulated that the disk is maintained thin. So the, uh, the, the processes that uh, are happening on small scales are, can be divided in two categories. Though some are destabilizing, such as the explosion of supernova, the generated turbulence, Maya mergers, accretions, and flyback. And some of them are stabilizing, and they are important because we're looking at an open system in which we keep injecting free energy in the form of rotational motion of cold gas. So there's stellar formation, which puts stars on, on a crazy circular orbit, cooling processes, shocks, and possibly align the accretion. So do, uh, do we see this uh, in isolated simulations? So I borrowed this slide from Tyson, uh, who's somewhere in the room in principle. And uh, we see that in isolated simulation, uh, the disks indeed ma ma manage to maintain uh, fit itself thin for a certain amount of time, even though you have all these uh, uh, complex competing processes on much smaller scales. 
But people who understand the turbulence better than me tell me that um, the key ingredient uh, when you have a turbulent cascade in order to form stars on small scales is that you have a sufficient energy induction on the largest scale of the cascade, which is the disk thickness as far as we're concerned, uh, in, a, in a compressive manner. So in some sense, you don't really care about the details of uh, the, the physics on small scale, as long as you have a mechanism to uh, quickly inject energy on the disk scale height uh, length. And so the wakes are going to play an important role in, uh, in um, self-regulating the disk by injecting uh, rapidly energy on that scale. So what is wake? I've been using this word a lot, but maybe it's not so clear what I mean uh, to all of you. So the classical picture is the uh, chandra sekar dynamical friction, when you've got deflection uh, behind the uh, moving body. But, uh, okay, no problem. But the, um, the, uh, in, in a system which is cold, uh, unlike uh, what is underlying the uh, chandra sekar picture, the, the wake itself uh, self-amplifies. The reason it self-amplifies is because in a cold system, uh, all, most of the orbits are quasi-circular, so stars have re sl r small relative motion, so they're going to build up gravitational interaction for a long time and get a strong amplification. And so the, the, the known result is that if you have a mestel disk, so flat rotation curve, and you put a mass of one in that disk, you get a wake whose um, um, mass is 140 times more massive than what the perturbation you put it. This is very important because this means colder disk will mean larger wakes, colder disk will mean stronger wakes, and colder disk will mean shorter dynamical time. So as the disk converges towards marginal stability, you get this um, strong response and rapid response. It's because it's long range uh, through coherent motion, it, and therefore it, oper it operates very quickly. So the, uh, the, the way to formalize this uh, ever so slightly is to look at damped mode. So if I look in the complex plane what uh, the, the damped mode of my system is, I introduce uh, the so-called gravitational dielectric function, which is like the dispersion relation of my disk. And so what it means is that if you have a damp mode which is close to the axis, any perturbation in potential will be amplified by a division by almost zero. And so dynamical times are shortened accordingly or frequencies are boosted accordingly. This is seen uh, in the Mestel disk uh, by work recently done by my student. And you see these four damping modes, uh, damp mode corresponding to the, the, the previous response. Uh, so this is very important in terms of how the system is going to rapidly heat if you uh, only allow it to heat. So what this means is that uh, uh, if I look at uh, the impact of this damped mode in terms of orbital diffusion, so how the orbits are displaced in this uh, guiding center versus eccentricity plane, you see that to these four modes correspond four ridges, and the, uh, the, the speed at which these ridges develop, so the speed at which the disk thickens or, or uh, warms up, is, is boosted by the, the squares of the gravitational susceptibility, so it's super rapid. So this typically remains stable because as they get close to marginal stability, they, they warm up quadratically in this proximity to marginal stability. So there's a very rapid self-response of the disk. Uh, and so we are in a situation where we have uh, uh, our previous uh, cartoon. And what happens is thanks to the wakes, we have a much tighter close control loop because uh, as soon as you depart from um, uh, as soon as the temperature goes down, you get a stronger uh, dynamical response of the disk to warm up. And uh, I guess I should wrap yeah, up. Uh, yeah. uh, so, um, and so the, the, the key ingredient is that proximity to marginal stability really accelerates uh, dramatically this, uh, this uh, loop. Uh, this is seen in simulation. If you measure the tumor parameter as a function of mass you, or redshift, you see that it converges towards uh, marginal stability, and I'm talking about the effective Q, which takes into account the gas and the stars. It, it matches the observation, but uh, I said I was doing theory, so I'll skip that. Uh, and uh, if I want to give you a cartoon understanding of what's happening in terms of the tightening of the, um, of the rings, uh, you can write a quadratic model uh, for uh, the set of uh, 
coplanar small eccentricity rings. Because it's quadratic, you can diagonalize it. And the point is that as, you, uh, as these weights increase, as you get closer to marginal stability, then the frequencies are boosted, so the amplitude of the response is being diminished. So you see in action the, uh, the settling of the disk as the disk gets close to marginal stability. We have one minute. Okay, so I'll, uh, I'll, <laughs> I'll just say one more word. If uh, you can write a reaction diffusion equation for this process where you have a term associated to star formation and feedback, you add on uh, the diffu orbital diffusion that I just mentioned, and the system will find a non-trivial equilibrium point corresponding to disk of a finite thickness. So you can formalize this uh, to some extent, and you see that this is the emergence of a Thin of disk of fixed size, which is driven by the uh, both uh, injection of energy and, and dissipation. And I'll okay. stop on this cartoon <laughs> because it's a, it triggers a lot of discussion usually. Yeah. So you should think of the cosmic web as uh, playing the role of the slope uh, for a, a bicycle, uh, which is um, uh, self steering along a, a slope. So you're in a situation where the, the, the reason the bicycle never falls is because as it leans, it turns, and as it learns, it leans. And it extracts free energy from the slope. And, uh, and uh, that's the, uh, and it's the analog of what the disks are doing thanks to the cosmic web. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so yeah, sorry, there was... No, no, questions. it's... Uh, there's too much to say in a short talk. <laughs> um, so, questions. So, uh, we'll have a microphone and try to ask you the microphone. I'll start with Stephen. Thanks. Thank you, Christopher, for the very interesting summary. I have a question regarding to the part where you mentioned about the discursion set theory, yes. putting in the context of where you conditioned the discursion set on the uh, saddle, the oh, presence yes. of saddle, that gives you naturally a slope. Uh, for the for delta, uh, yes. basically a different equation history. Have you looked at this in terms of the assembly bias? It seems it seems that naturally you know, have a prediction for the formation history of halo of well, the same mass. This is work which was led by Corentin and uh, Marcelo, who are both in the room. So you should ask them for more details if you want. But uh, we looked at the uh, formation time of the dark halo. So that's one way of quantifying. Uh, assembly bias. I don't like the term assembly bias because it describes things as everything should be relative to what dark matter says, so it's the theory of non-elephant as far as I'm concerned. But uh, yes, it, 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 it's a way of describing, I asked actually a chat GPT what assembly bias was two days ago. <laughs> so I guess it falls into that category. Uh, Thanks. <laughs> so uh, what was clear to me So, uh, so uh, in particular, how are you finding the, uh, the saddle points? Is that in real space or in uh, image of energy space? Um, it depends what aspect of the work. So I presented mostly theoretical insights based on doing things mostly in Lagrangian space. But uh, a lot of the measurements were done also in simulation, where we do measurement in Eulerian space. And uh, depending on scales. Uh, the question is how the special points map back from final state space to initial state space. And uh, I'm a firm believer, and I'm glad. You taught me this, so. <laughs> Those are the wall-like things. So have you looked at all of that stuff within the context 
what you're doing. Okay, so yes, you're right, uh, everything moves. Uh, in some sense, looking at uh, position of saddles relative to halo removes some of the motion. Some of it is still there, uh, and it's important for the point of view angular momentum advection, as I've argued. And yes, we have looked at uh, the counterparts in terms of walls of all these things, and I think it's one of the, if I had more time, I wanted to do uh, what, uh, what things we should do as a community. I think this is one of them. Walls have been uh, underestimated, or they, uh, they are playing an important role, for instance. Disappearance of walls, I think, is related to uh, spin flips as well. Uh, so, um, the, 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 the point of this presentation was to argue that uh, in the language of uh, sufficient statistics, I think uh, uh, considering not just the halos, but uh, the, their surrounding critical points is, uh, is an interesting venue. And so I want to raise one thing because we raise a nine, uh, an asterisk here, and this has been a problem forever and they really interested. How does one decide what defines a supercluster in terms of the human process? Surely not a saddle. ChatGPT told me superclusters don't exist. <laughs> <laughs> Christoph, I think Jansop uh, work is uh, related a little bit of that uh, relation between the saddles and the peaks. Uh, yeah, that's one of the figures time. I showed at the beginning, right? And so if you smooth at something like 5 megaparsec scale, there's some preservation of relation. Ah, yeah, 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 you're right. Of, uh, this is something we looked a couple of weeks ago. So if you look at this cross-correlation between uh, critical points, and you look at the redshift evolution, you find that they don't change very much uh, because oh, of I the... F so you, but that makes it a multi-point process. Yes, point yes. Yes. Um, your presentation regarding the uh, significance of cosmic web on yes. galaxies is impressive. Okay. I'm convinced <laughs> by now. Well, everybody in this room should be at some point. <laughs> <laughs> um, having said that, in the community, um, it's been an issue uh, which one is more important for galaxy formation and evolution between mass and environment. Okay. Now. Going back to your suggestion, now do you imply that even the mass effect is actually a uh, indirect effect of cosmic web? No, As a result, I, there is actually no internal effect at all. I, I would have a hard time arguing this because most measurements suggest that the fundamental quantity defining uh, galaxies is mass. I mean, if, so, uh, but. The, this title comes from a annoying remark that Martin White made during the Edinburgh meeting because we're trying to argue the cosmic web was important for galaxy formation. I think there's a consensus and for cosmology. And uh, Martin was making the counterpoint or playing the devil's advocate. Well, we don't care about the cosmic web if we're extracting the six numbers. And so I've been spending the last four years being annoyed by this remark. <laughs> and uh, while preparing this talk, I tried to convince myself that I think it's to do with a misunderstanding of what you call the cosmic web. If you call the cosmic web in the, in the strictest sense the very large structure that you see in these surveys, then the question of how something on 10 or 50 megaparsec scale affects galaxies on 10 kiloparsec scale is indeed questionable. But if you think about the cosmic web as being this multi-scale uh, structure uh, uh, that every halo is surrounded by its rigging, its, its saddle points and its uh, walls, then uh, the anisotropy uh, is important and is there at all possible, at most scales until you've got uh, genes moving, right? So in that sense, uh, I would argue that uh, it's, it's misleading to describe the cosmic web strictly as just the largest uh, structure of the universe. Um, just may ask, do we have any questions from uh, outside, right? People are... Tom. <laughs> 
That, okay, works. Um, yes, uh, actually, let me ask you for, you know, um, you made it very specific. You, know, you need to smooth on different scales and really study how the properties change and the critical points change yes. as a smoothing scale. So can I get you to, you know, say a little bit more about the smallest scales? What are the actual smallest scales you care about and how, you know, that will depend on dark matter, I suppose, and the properties of the dark matter. And just curious on your opinions about the smallest scales of the web. It's what you call a good question, or no, a bad question, because I don't really know the answer. Um, I wanted to highlight that it's multi-scale, and uh, uh, yesterday I, I asked myself the same question you asked me. Uh, the stupid answer, the, the obvious answer is to say, uh, uh, once you add the variance, uh, the, um, um, the, 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 you define the genes length uh, according to their temperature, and then you wash out structure on smaller scales. So in that sense, uh, maybe the temperature of the gas sets the smaller scales over which this is relevant. I should uh, emphasize that I'm a dynamicist, and I was told at school that uh, gravity dominates over most forces on most scales in, in uh, astrophysics. So my viewpoint is that you try and explain everything in terms of gravitational processes. Of course, it's not strictly true, right? So this is a counterexample where the smallest scale is set by a baryonic physics. But still, uh, if, if I did make a little sense in the last part of my talk, um, if you just uh, account for simple things about the gas, that the fact that it shocks, therefore it's going to flow along strictly the cosmic web, uh, you, you can see that uh, it's still gravity which sets up the web, so it's still gravity which, which defines the geometry of uh, what's happening. Uh, it's not strictly true also. Well, I clue till it sets up, or you, I don't know where. Oh, there you are. Okay, I wonder if you want to set up. I just wondered if you made some comment about four mergers in a history of a halo. <laughs> um, or, or in history of a peak, rather, but practically speaking, um, what does that turn into? I mean, it doesn't mean, I mean, the nodes sometimes can have several galaxies in them, for instance, the peaks, and uh, or several halos, right? And uh, um, I mean, whenever you, so this is thing of former, I just wondered what it, I mean, you're asking me what happens to form. Or what does it what does it turn into practically? If I was looking at halos or something, what would what does the four mergers in the history of a peak translate into? It's four mergers of a of a ah, node. number four. You're talking about number four. four. Ah, what does it translate into? The fact that it's typically four mergers. It 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 means that uh, the original uh, hierarchical clustering scenario is putting a lot of emphasis on. Uh, equal mice mergers or many mergers, it turns out that the actual number within the history of the universe is, is of significant mergers is quite small. This is a well-known numerical fact. What's interesting about this theory is that you can, uh, you can sort of extract this from the initial condition, which is, uh, and, uh, and uh, the initial condition also gives you the geometry of these mergers. So that tells you something about angular momentum acquisition as well in the non-diffuse form. I forgot to say I spoke about theory, and Clotilde is going to tell us about. 